Marcy, um, pick up on the issue that Porter just has raised. Obviously, in the case of Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. people come to you for Syria and for other international issues of that sort. And yet, a Pew Research paper that came out a few weeks ago uh, suggested that you didn't actually cover Syria on AJAM, American Al Jazeera, uh, any more than CNN. Well, I don't think, um, you know, our mission isn't to cover just the Middle East. Um, it is, I don't think an American audience wants to look at an entire channel of just news about the Middle East. I think that, that what we're trying to do is, is give our audience information about, about everything, about all around the world, not just, not just the Middle East, not just America, but in countries, you know, to Elaine's point, to, to countries that they're not used to hearing about. But you have to give the viewer a reason to turn to your network. Well, I think that our reason is going to be sort of counter-programming to what they're getting now. I think that there's, we think, MSNBC and Fox are shouting and opinions <laughs> and, uh, you know, people seem to be getting fed up with that. Uh, the other morning it was, and, and we're determined not to do it, and it was really kind of funny, yesterday morning we had two opposing people on our air in the mor in, um, on the 8 o'clock show, and they started to raise their voices with each other, and the anchor said, excuse me, gentlemen, gentlemen, this is Al Jazeera, we don't yell. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was funny because when he came back into the newsroom from the studio, everybody was clapping for him because we don't want that. We don't want to turn into just screaming people. We want to turn into intelligent discourse, intelligent conversation. I can disagree with you. I can tell you my opinions, and we don't have to be, you know, yelling maniacs at each other. And it's not going away. I mean, we're going to be right back to all the yelling and screaming in a couple of months when we go around um, and do another vote on the debt ceiling. I mean, th they're going to pass well, it doesn't it go away even... When they're in the right, house. exactly. Yeah. But it's just never even going away. When you extend the debt ceiling, you're still <laughs> shouting. It's, it's, it's a way exciting. of life. I, mean, I, was, I was impressed watching Al Jazeera last night, a program which some of you may have, may have seen called America Tonight with Joey Chen. And they did an hour, which is basically it's, it's a nightly magazine show for television, they did an hour without even a mention of the debt ceiling. Well, one of the things we do, we have a conference call in the morning, and all of the shows that are connected along with the hard news broadcasts are on this, and we talk about what topics we're going to bring up. Now, the hard news people are, you know, that's the group I'm in charge of, is basically, you know, covering a, a you know, wide area of, of stories. But the programs, America Tonight, The Stream, Consider This, Inside Story, they have single topics or multiple topics that are sometimes related to what's in the news, and sometimes not. And one of the things we do on that conference call is we decide, you know what, it's just too much debt covered. It's too much of this government shutdown. It's enough already. Let's do something else. And so these programs will pick different topics because, you know, again, the way the networks, or the way the cable networks program now, it's, it feels like they can only do one thing at a time. Like, why can you only cover the government shutdown and you can't cover other things? So we want to give the viewer some variety and some information other than, you know, there's only so much we can tell about the government shutdown. This is what happened. And this is, politically, this is what happened. One of the ways we're covering the government shutdown is going out into America and talking <coughs> about how it's affecting all the different types of people that, it, that it's affecting, as opposed to just the politicians in Washington. I mean, a number of us on this panel come out of old old television, the old networks, NBC, ABC, CBS. I think Marcy and I, before there was a CNN, uh, we, we, we were on, on the scene. Um, and we always thought when the advent of 24-7 news came along that we would get a tremendous variety of stories. Instead, what we got was repetitiveness, the same story over and over again, 24 by You can blame uh, Roger Ailes. <laughs> Blame, well, Roger blame Ailes Roger had Ailes. something to do with, with the opinion channel right. as opposed to news channel. But let me ask Elaine Reyes, what does CCTV news bring to the table? I mean, I was watching the other night, and uh, there was an excellent uh, series of reports on cancer villages in China. But again, similar to Al Jazeera, there is a much larger agenda. What stories does CCTV bring that others don't have? Well, for example, last night um, we did 
gloss over the debt ceiling debate and what was happening in Washington. But to take it a step further, we spent more time talking about the global impact of what's happening in Washington, which countries should be paying attention to what's happening in Washington, and what the strategy is uh, for these countries in, in dealing with Washington. You're looking at, it's, it's a political and economic uh, issue. But politically, if you're seeing uh, lawmakers of the United States fighting and disagreeing, how are they going to deal with them when it comes to bilateral relations? Um, we did a series last week on fracking, energy. We didn't stay in the United States. We looked at fracking in the US, fracking in Canada, fracking in Europe, fracking in Asia, fracking in South America. So each night there was a different uh, viewpoint, a different part of the world and, and how um, they're dealing with, with energy because we're using more and more of it. And tell us a bit about the show that you do on weekends because there was an identification of a particular part of coverage which was being undercovered by other networks, and then you launched the show on Sunday night. So on Sunday nights at 8.30 Eastern Time, uh, my anchor show called America's Now, and it is a 30-minute magazine-style long-format show that focuses on Latin America. All sorts of issues um, from the Venezuelan elections last year, what was happening down there, to what is happening in Brazil with all the protests. They have another presidential election coming up next year, the issues with the World Cup, uh, the Olympics, child labor. We're actually doing a story uh, on child labor in Latin America this week. Um, last week, we did um, two shows on location in Bali, going back to APEC, um, where I interviewed the president of Mexico and the president of Chile, and what those countries are doing with Asia, the type of agreements they're making, uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, just a lot of economic transactions that are taking place between that region and Asia. So it's not about the United States at all. But you're seeing a lot of really interesting stories, not just serious, <laughs> but um, we've done a few stories that have actually, once we've aired them, they've somehow popped up on CNN <laughs> and some of the other big networks. ABC did a, a, a sort of a copy story uh, that we did about um, adoptions in Colombia where children back in the 80s were being kidnapped <coughs> and sold and now are being reunited with their families. So that's, that was, I believe, uh, on Dateline or, or one of the NBC magazine shows. Um, there was a, a, another big story about the divers off the coast of Honduras who they dive for, um, it's, it's their way of living, but they're dying. That's all they do is, is they dive for uh, shellfish to sell, but they, they don't use equipment, they just kind so of... So the idea is to find content that nobody else is doing. Basically. I mean, all these other networks are pulling out of these regions, as, as we were mentioning before, right. and so we're keeping a lot of those people. Some of those people work for the BBC, uh, work for some of the other big networks, and, and so we're keeping them down there and, and looking for stories that you're not seeing anywhere else. I mean, Up until last week, uh, CCTV had four correspondents that they inherited from the BBC. Last week, Al Jazeera hired one of them away from CCTV. <laughs> in Buenos Aires. A lot of so we lost our Buenos Aires <laughs> correspondent to Al Jazeera. So, I mean, in, in fact, I think it's fair to say that between Al Jazeera and the Chinese, that's where all the coverage is of South America. You don't see yeah. hardly any coverage of of uh, Brazil. Mm. I mean, Brazil, what an important country. CTV has three correspondents there. Al Jazeera, I think, has two, two, two. one in Sao Paulo and one in uh, Rio. Rio. And, and these are stories that are not being told in other places. Now, when I watch NHK Newsline, I'm usually on my treadmill <laughs> at my gym because the hotel next door has the transmission of NHK coming in. And so I'm, I'm huffing and puffing and trying to get fit, and I'm wanting, watching NHK Newsline. And uh, th this morning, for example, your, your lead story was Typhoon Japan. Your second story was Iran, excellent coverage from Iran. And then your third story was this ridiculous Washington charade that's been going on. Mm -hmm. So I mean, how does NHK distinguish itself content-wise? NHK takes the position of uh, first having the perspective on Asia, but it covers worldwide events and news. And it, it, as I said in the beginning, 
We're not just a news channel. We have the news line live at the top of the hour. We have 30 news bureaus scattered throughout the world, three here in the United States, New York, Washington, and Los Angeles. But uh, uh, a heavy concentration, obviously, throughout Asia. More of those news bureaus are now starting to hire English-speaking reporters to uh, expand and be utilized to a higher degree than they have been uh, able to in the past. Because remember, NHK was built this huge enterprise that has uh, more than 10,000 employees scattered throughout the world. It was built on the basis of news being fed to Japan, not from Japan. So there's a, this is part of the, the uh, new process that has taken place since 2009. The 24-hour channel started up in February of 2009. Um, <clears throat> one story that was uh, reminded me when, as you were talking was, this goes back a ways, but about six months before President Obama was reelected, we had specials and a lot of, a lot of coverage about Myanmar. I actually uh, was on a panel and uh, led the panel with uh, our uh, Asia Biz forecast host at the time, talking about the, uh, the country and what was going on. And uh, six months later, when President Obama was elected, his first overseas trip, you'll recall, the first stop was Myanmar. Americans didn't have any idea what was going on. And if they had been watching NHK, they would have had a much better understanding of the growth and the opportunity in these developing regions. So that's the approach that I think NHK uh, serves and the, and the value. But NHK sees itself as a global player. As you mentioned, they've been a longtime partner with ABC. And uh, so they see themselves as a network that, yes, it covers a lot of Japan, a lot of Asia, but when worldwide events happen, like the activities that are going on in Washington right now, they're there. They, they want to be uh, reporting that as well. I also learned this morning that there's a Japanese astronaut getting ready to go on the space station. Didn't know that. You, know, you wouldn't see it on Fox. Right. You know, um, Jim, I, one of the things we all have in common is that we all want to do quality journalism, what a concept, um, and, and tell people about things that they don't know and in, in interesting ways send our reporters to places that other people companies aren't sending them to, and whether we're based in the United States and talking about U.S. news or talking about other um, overseas news, the fact of the matter is we're trying to raise the bar. We're trying to say, you're smart, your audience, you are smart enough to understand this and to want to get it and to want to learn something about some place that maybe you know, you be, you know very little about and why it matters to you. That's one of the things we try to do. We try to do stories about a faraway place or about a complicated issue like Obamacare or like um, the climate change and tell people why it matters to them and explain it rather than just, you know, he feels this way and she feels that way. Now, I have a 21-year-old son who doesn't watch anything on television. And I don't think anybody who's 21 does. So what Sorry. is Al Jazeera doing? online. I understand you have a bit of a problem with the old-fashioned cable operators who resist the online revolution. Well, we're in a, we're in a particularly difficult situation <coughs> with our online at the moment. Um, because of contracts that have to do with when Current had the channel and all that, we are at the moment not allowed to st live stream our right. TV on our website. So the website basically has to, you know, cover their own they can't take our video. They can't. So the website is the AJAM website as opposed to the Al Jazeera English website. The other one is blocked, isn't it? Is it the not? Al Jazeera English is now blocked in the United States, and that's unfortunate because it was a great website. It's a great website. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but Al Jazeera America's website will eventually get better and better once the restrictions are, are lifted. And they, they will be lifted? I, I, we're hoping they will be lifted. All this, everything's a negotiation. But one of the things we're doing on air is we're doing a show called The Stream, which is uh, targeting a younger audience and getting a younger audience. And people uh, Skype in and they call in and they, uh, they Twitter in and they, you know, all that. So, and we pick topics that are of interest to the millennials and, and that's getting a little bit of traction. Now, Lane, just recently, the 8 o'clock news, which you often anchor out of Washington, introduced interactivity for the first time. Right. So we have a segment um, on our news hour called Your Say that is a very interactive uh, means of, of getting our viewers to respond to a question that we pose during the day. So we'll take a hot topic that people are talking about, 
Um, yesterday it was cyberbullying based on the story in Florida where the 12-year-old girl um, committed suicide after being cyberbullied by two other teenagers. And it's not just happening in the United States, it's happening everywhere. And cyberbullying is, is on the rise. So we pose to our viewers, what is an appropriate um, punishment for cyberbullying? And we go to Twitter, we go to Weibo, which is the Chinese Twitter, version of Twitter, uh, and Facebook and, and email. And so we call these responses from our viewers and, and post them at the end of our show as a way to see what the pulse is. And it, it's global, so our responses are from all over the world. It's not just the United States, it's not just uh, from China. We have some Chinese uh, uh, viewers, and, and like I said, Africa is in play, but we have viewers all over the world who who will write in, and uh, it's a way to sort of keep a pulse on what's happening throughout the day, what people are saying.